When a man walks into his kitchen, he has no idea he's about to be confronted with absolute insanity. And then we travel to Western Illinois University. Get your book bags ready, pack a fresh frisbee, and we head off back to school. But we're not going to have a lot of time to study because we're constantly interrupted by phone calls from the beyond. Today on Dead Rabbit Radio. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Dead Rabbit Radio. I'm your host, Jason Carpenter. I'm having a great day. I hope you guys are having a great day too. Hope you guys are having tons of fun doing whatever you're doing. We got a lot of stuff to cover today. So first off, running into Dead Rabbit Command, everyone give it up for one of our legacy Patreon supporters, Rabbit Fish. Woohoo, yeah, we ha <laughs> ha. He's all swimming around. Don't let him bite you. He's rabid. Rabbit Fish is a longtime supporter of the show. YouTube commenter from way back in the day. Very, very glad to have you still part of the show, Rabbit Fish. You're gonna be our captain or pilot this episode. You guys can't support the Patreon, I totally understand, I really do. I do, honestly, because I don't support a lot of Patreons myself. That's okay, it really is. Just help spread the word about Dead Rabbit Radio. That helps out so much. Tell your friends, tell your family, tell everyone you know. Dead Rabbit Radio is your favorite paranormal show. Also, just a reminder to the Patreons, we are having our monthly movie night this Friday. It's going to be Friday, June 30th at 7 p.m., Pacific Standard Time, we're going to be watching a lot of really cool short films, including some Alex Magana ones. <laughs> Alex Magana is a very impressive short filmmaker. He puts out a short film a week. It's crazy. Rabbit Fish, let's go ahead and get this party started. I'm going to toss you the launch codes for the Lego Morph Launcher. We're going to try this again. <laughs> what is it made out of Legos? What's a Lego? Is it Lago Morph? <sighs> Never mind. We're going to go ahead and toss you the keys to the Rabbit Rocket Ship. Everyone climb on board as Rabbit Fish takes us up, up and away out of Dead Rabbit Command. We're flying all the way out to a house in the suburbs. <laughs> probably a bit overkill, probably a bit overkill to take a spaceship. But, you know, I like doing the sound effect. We land in the suburban neighborhood. We don't know exactly where this story took place. But we do have a date. June 22nd, 2023. Very, very recent story. We're about to meet this young couple. We have, and these names aren't the real ones. If they are your real names, it's just random luck. We have a young woman named Maggie and her boyfriend, Jake. And they live together at this house, but Maggie is hanging out at her mom's house. They're kicking back, watching some people's court enjoying a refreshing afternoon when all of a sudden, I don't know, she actually didn't say she was watching people's court, but it's a good show. Why wouldn't she be? Maggie and her mom are hanging out at the mom's house. All of a sudden, she gets a phone call from her boyfriend, Jake. Maggie's like, what? Hello? Hello? And Jake's like, oh my God, Maggie, you won't believe what just happened. (laughs) You won't believe it. In fact, Jason said it was insane in the intro. That should tell you where it's going. Maggie's like, what? Who's Jason? What, what, what's going on? She goes, listen, I just got home. And I walked into the kitchen, because that's where our laptop's at. And I sit down, and I open up the laptop, and I'm clickety-clacking on the keys. And then all of a sudden, I realize something. I don't know if he has some sort of sixth sense. I don't know if the presence made itself felt in some sort of way. It could have also been that he turned around to get a glass of orange juice. I don't know. But Jake was sitting at the the kitchen table using his laptop when he turns around and sitting in the middle of the kitchen floor. Hundreds of maggots. Hundreds upon hundreds of maggots are squirming across the floor. They're like climbing on top of each other. They're doing that little oozy motion. So they kind of like move a little muscles and then 
stop it and move some more mud. It's like they're using their shoulders, right, to squirm all around. Hundreds upon hundreds of maggots in a pile in his kitchen, and he's like, no, no, you're like, Jason, that's not insane. Like, do they start flying? Do they talk to him? Do they have shoulders, apparently? That's not insane. That's just the sign of a dirty kitchen. Well, hold on, hold on. You don't let me finish. You don't let me finish. Jake turns around and he sees hundreds and hundreds of maggots in this giant writhing pile on his kitchen floor. And he's like, it's I'm going insane. I'm like, Jason, wait, is this seriously all that it is? Here's the thing. Yeah, it is just a pile of maggots. They're not supernatural. Well, they might be, but they don't fly around. They don't form a giant mouth and start talking to him about how he needs to now find an axe and start killing demons, but they look like humans. It's just a big pile of maggots in the middle of the kitchen. And Jake, he didn't go insane. He didn't go insane. He just got a broom. Well, this is gross. I didn't, I don't, I've never dealt with more than, in my life, I've probably dealt with five maggots at a time. Maybe. So the idea of if I came home and found hundreds of maggots in a pile... I that that would shock me too. I wouldn't know how to get rid of them. I would have never thought. I mean, once I read this, I go, "Oh, that makes sense." He just he just got a broom and he swept them outside. But I would imagine the maggots would be like hanging on to the bristles in the broom. They're like getting stuck in there, and they're like, "Hold on, boys, we're almost flies. We'll get out of here soon." Like it would be like sweeping up spaghettios, sentient spaghettios. They're all squirming around. It it like maybe a dustpan or a push broom. Would also work. Scoop them up. Well, anyways, he's able to get rid of these maggots. He brushed them outside the door. Now, while <laughs> the beginning was a little clickbaity, he did not go insane. He's not currently locked up in a loony bin. He's like, no, they're putting the straight jacket on him. He's like, no, now I'm a maggot. I'm king of the maggots. And they're like, okay, lock his door, put him in the soundproof room. King of the maggots, it's me. He didn't go insane, but here's the thing about this story. I do find this story super interesting. One, because it's disgusting. Two, because Jake and Maggie, they're, they say, we have checked all over the house. There is nothing in this house that could produce hundreds of maggots. Not in the sense like, yeah, there are flies and stuff like that. But the house has never been stinky, like there has been a decaying animal. They've checked all over the house to see where could these maggots have come from. They can't find any source of these things. Hundreds of maggots just right in the middle of their kitchen floor. They can't find any source of them. And someone said it's possible that they were in they were in the ceiling, like in the the attic area of the house, and they were falling through a light fixture. If they were, if it was directly underneath a light fixture. But but I think, you know, a lot of times people are so quick to debunk these stories. Remember, he walked into the kitchen, sat down and started using his laptop. So we and then he discovered the maggots. I mean, if you walked into your kitchen, there could be a maggot or two that you don't notice at first. <laughs> You're like, oh, oh, yes, my fresh bowl of rice. Yum, yum, yum. Not knowing that you just ate two maggots. But it would be a little hard to walk into your kitchen and miss a giant pile of maggots. I mean, it'd just be a little more difficult. So what it seems like is he walked into the kitchen, there were no maggots. He starts working on his laptop, he gets up hundreds of maggots. And it's so interesting, when people post these stories online, this was posted underneath the name That Space Alien. That was the username. Maggie was the one who posted it. There's always this super fast rush. You just see a ton of people trying to debunk it. It's weird it's it's like a race to the bottom a lot of times and they don't read the narrative they're not actually reading the story they're just like maggots they're just immediately typing in their comment so they appeared in a pretty short while hundreds of maggots they're not falling out of the ceiling they're not there by any natural means and that's really what i'm getting at is yes it's fun to talk about maggots but i would also think that these were not maggots from this reality or at least not from I'm not saying they're like interdimensional maggots but it's possible that just put on our conspiracy caps here bear bear with me you're like Jason, just stop talking about maggots i'll do anything you want 
what I'm getting at is these maggots may actually have a paranormal source. And I don't really know what it would be. I don't know if they like tumbled through an alternate dimension or the Mandela effect. They shifted realities. Maggie and Jake used to live in a really, really crummy house. And then he was walking home. He was walking in the door and he's like, oh, law of attraction. I don't want to be covered in filth anymore. Give me the house of my dreams, dreams, dreams. And he transports himself to a universe where he's no longer the filthiest man on the block. <laughs> but the maggots came with him. He's like, no, I'm going insane. <laughs> I have the power of a god. But the maggots do too. It's possible that the maggots have some sort of paranormal origin. And you know what's interesting about this too is obviously maggots are connected to death. Flies are connected to Satan, specifically Beelzebub, whatever name you want to use, Lucifer, the Lord of the Flies. Flies are connected to dark energy. Maggots are connected to death. It could be an omen. There's, there's a lot of different things that this could be. But I, here's the thing. If I came home and there was a bunch of maggots in my house, first thing I would do after I was done throwing up and trying to sweep them up with a regular broom before grabbing a shovel is I would scour the house looking for the cause of the maggots. I wouldn't immediately go, well, that's paranormal. I, I would check my house for like if I discarded a piece of pork chop underneath the couch or, you know, there was a dead rat under my pillowcase. Yeah, I'd check for that stuff. But once that stuff was accounted for, I would go, there might be something weird here. There's, I mean, obviously, there's a pile of maggots in your house, but there might be something paranormal here, and the omens point towards bad things. Rabbit fish, let's go ahead and toss you the keys of the carpenter copter. We are leaving behind this maggot-filled kitchen. Fly us all the way out to Illinois. <laughs> We're headed out to Illinois. Specifically, we're headed out to Maycomb. And more specific than that, let's go to Western Illinois University. Now, it's funny. We cover a lot of haunted colleges on this podcast. And it, it, it makes sense, right? I actually have kind of discussed it before. It makes sense that we have a lot of stories of haunted colleges for two reasons. First off, the obvious one is that spooky stories are cool, and every single year you get an influx of greenhorns. You get a bunch of new people who are new to the college, definitely, and maybe even new to the area, and you can fill these freshman heads with all sorts of creepy tales, and it's fun to scare people. But there's also, that's the skeptical answer, and I think that's why these stories at least spread very quickly. Now, you could say most of these stories are fake, Jason. They are just out to scare people. But I think they definitely were more scared. We have a heightened level of anxiety when we're in a new place. So when you show up and you're in your dorm and all of a sudden the, your roommates are telling you, hey, I heard that every night before you go to bed, <laughs> someone's going to break into the fridge and eat your food and it's a ghost. Then don't blame me. You're going to hear stories about if you go to the shower late at night, you'll hear a girl banging on the stall next to you screaming for her life and you check and there's no one there. And all, you're already anxious. You're already away from home for the first time. These stories are easily going to spread and you could say no, they're just made up. Just like any urban legend. But what's interesting too, from a paranormal side, colleges are psychic engines right people are going through some of the most turbulent times in their life they're an adult for the first time they're away from their families for the first time every decision they make the consequence falls solely on them and you're being tested not just literally because you have tests but you're constantly having to face these decisions that you may have never faced before and that generates a lot of anxiety. That generates a lot of love and passion and despair and depression. All of these things that are just so unique to the human condition are happening every single day at a college. But at Western Illinois University, we also have an interesting extra tidbit to this. The university was founded in 1899 
And after their centennial, right, 100 years later, they were doing this big ceremony at Western Illinois University. And they're like, we made it, guys. We're 100 years old. Yay. Everyone's all clapping. Yay, yay, yay. And then they go, we have actually dug up this cornerstone. There was like this cornerstone to this building. It was the first building on campus as part of this centennial tradition as part of this centennial celebration i don't know if there was a time capsule under there or anything cool or if they just kind of kicked a little dirt around but what they found out when western illinois university was founded and nobody knew about this nobody knew about this for a hundred years western illinois university was founded on land donated by the local freemasons group like what (laughs) nobody nobody knew that i mean obviously the freemasons did they didn't go hey barry what did you what you do with all that land we accumulated he's like what what i can't tell you for a hundred years the freemasons knew about it hundred years ago in 1899 the make home freemasons behind the scenes was pulling the strings because they're they were going to build this western illinois university somewhere in the state the western part of the state and behind the scenes, the Maycomb Freemasons were pulling the strings to get it built there. Why? Who knows? A bunch of different cities it could have went to. They're pulling the strings. They got the land. They got all this stuff organized. And this information was hidden in the cornerstone of the original building on campus. Now, did the Freemasons have some sort of nefarious... <laughs> You're nodding your head right now. You're like, yes, yes. Did the Freemasons have any sort of nefarious goal in founding this university? We don't know. We don't know. But Freemasons are definitely deeply connected into conspiracy theory lore. And I think in a lot of ways they're connected. And in a lot of ways that people don't realize or expect, they're also connected to the paranormal and spiritual world. There's a lot of stories about behind the scenes Freemason stuff that's very, um, at the very least, ritualistic. And at the very most, trying to tap into greater power sources beyond what mortal man would know. So it's very interesting that this college we're about to look at that has some standard haunted college stuff and and then a few things that we haven't seen before. It is interesting that they are behind this. Is it nefarious that they create some sort of psychic sucking machine so they could use its power for their own purposes? Or do they just want to have a nice university in their neck of the woods? We don't know. However, let's take a look at some of these ghost stories that are happening on West... A lot of these people say they're still happening today. Western Illinois University. First off, Grab your skateboards, kids. We're skating across campus. This is taking place during the summer. The campus is abandoned at this point. Even the janitors are gone for the season. Woohoo! We're on our skateboards. We're grinding down the stairs. Wee! Let's head out to Bayless Hall. Uh, hey guys, let's get off here. And now we'll just walk calmly. I guess we can skate through the through the building because no one's gonna stop us. We're in Bayless Hall. Let's head to room 117. We're walking up there, and apparently this room is haunted because way back in the day, there was a student there who was secretly pregnant. But she knew she was pregnant. Nobody else did. And so people are just kind of going about their day, doing their homework, and walking down the hallway. And this woman, we'll call her Becky, she's like, oh. My stomach hurts. My stomach hurts. I've gotten progressively bigger, but no one's noticed for the past nine months. And now my stomach hurts. I know what this means. The baby is coming, but I don't want to have this baby. So I'm just going to go into my room and give birth to it, which is crazy because it takes a while at a hospital. I know some people are different, but I'm guessing this baby just kind of fell out. And then... She has the baby. What was her name again? Becca? Becky? She has the baby and she goes, I don't want this baby. So she threw it down a trash chute. You know, like they have those things a lot of times in like high, high multiple story apartment complexes. You open up the trash (laughs) chute. She doesn't know what a trash chute is. I do live in the modern world. Throws her baby down the trash chute and then hangs herself in the closet. Apparently that room's haunted. People complain about ghostly occurrences in there. 
I didn't write them down. <laughs> I forgot to write the ones down for that. You're like, Jason, what? What? What is it? Is it orbs? Is it people knocking on the walls? Is sound of a baby crying? I don't know. I forgot to write it down. But anyways, let's move on to the next one. Because, oh, that's also, in, I also didn't write that one down either. So apparently in Bayless Hall, room 501, and another student hung themselves. So they don't say why that person hung themselves. They're like, oh, man, my only goal in life was to throw a baby in the trash, and I didn't do it. Ugh. Don't worry, these other ghost ones I wrote down. But apparently Bayless Hall has just some average ghost activity. The stuff you would expect when two college students kill themselves and a baby, and a baby flies down a garbage chute. Let's head off to Simpkins Hall. We're now at Simpkins Hall. Apparently this one has had a lot of odd and creepy ghost encounters. Whatever happened to Bayless Hall obviously didn't impress me that much because I didn't write it down. But Simpkins Hall, people on the third floor of the building. So apparently this is where the theater is located in Simpkins Hall. Because a lot of people who are working late in the theater and just people kind of walking around Simpkins Hall day or night will hear the sound of jingling keys. Jingling. Actually, I'll go get my keys. You're like, Jason, seriously, out of all the sound effects you've ever done on your show, this is the one you get a prop for? If you're walking down the hallway of Simpkins Hall, you may hear this sound. Probably not as, probably not so aggressively. It's not like the guy's jumping up and down. It's not like he's running a marathon. If you hear the sound of jingling keys when you're at Simpkins Hall, you're hearing the sound of a ghost janitor. They never said how he died, but he died. And now his ghost forever roams Simpkins Hall. And people have reported you can hear the sound of a janitor's cart being wheeled around and sometimes it sounds like he's emptying trash into this phantom cart. I talked about this on yesterday's episode. I go, how terrifying would it be that if you die at your job, you then have to do that job for the rest of your life? Like, maybe this guy really loved being a janitor. Maybe this guy loved the art of the custodian. But probably not so much that he wants to do it for the rest of eternity. But there he is. You can hear him going about his day, doing his job, the jingle jingle of his keys. When there's no janitor to be found, <laughs> there's garbage everywhere. There's piles of maggots in each room. You're like, ah, I know the janitor is not really here, but I can clearly hear the janitor. That's on the third floor of the building. If you go down to the first floor, it's haunted by the ghost of a little girl. Creepiest of all phantoms. It's haunted by the ghost of a little girl. People will see her. And sometimes she'll look at you and go, would you like to play with me? And there's no reports of anyone actually playing with her. There's no reports of being like, well, I do have this test to study for, but you know what? I could play ball for a little bit with you girls. <laughs> what are you talking about? I have a Nintendo Switch. How old of a ghost do you think I am? People just say that she says, do you want to play? I think the reason why no one has said, oh yeah, and then we sit there and we play a game of hopscotch, for two reasons. One, people aren't stupid. <laughs> people aren't stupid. If a ghost girl ever asks you, do you want to play? Don't ever play. It's a setup. She's going to eat you. And secondly, um, if you did play with her, C.1, she ate, she ate the student. She ate whoever said, yeah, yeah, sure. Maybe the janitor. Maybe the janitor goes, yeah, little girl, I'll play a game with you. And now he's a ghost janitor for all of time. But yeah, so we have Simpkins Hall with those two ghosts. Thompson Hall, we have stories of, I think this is like a dorm, because people will say you'll hear banging or knocking on the walls of your room. And before you go, well, Jason, that's just the person in the next room over. They said, no, like if it, the room is sectioned off, let's say you're in the living area, you'll hear the knocking coming from your bathroom. And when people have said we've heard it on our walls, like our living room wall walls, it, no one was next door. Because obviously, if someone was knocking on your wall, and you knew that someone lived there, you wouldn't even classify that as paranormal. You, that's just annoying. You call the RA. But you hear the knock, knock, knocking, and it's not coming from a human. Here's a weird thing. I did a quick 
research check, something I should have done before I started recording the episode. I looked up Bayless Hall's ghost because there was another ghost I didn't write this stuff down for. I'm starting to slip. I'm starting to lose it. Thompson Hall, they would hear... No, we already did that one. Tanner Hall, is apparently the 12th floor of that building, that must be pretty tall, is haunted. Back in 1972, a student apparently was having a water fight. I don't know if they had squirt guns and throwing water balloons or whatever. It probably wasn't permitted. They fell down an elevator shaft. They were like, oh no, I don't want to get, I don't want to get wet, even though I started this water fight. I'm made of sugar. As he was trying to avoid getting wet, he fell down an elevator shaft to his death. His ghost is sighted walking around the 12th floor of Tanner Hall. But while I was looking that up, I said, you know, since I got the computer in front of me, let's look up Bayless Hall. What actually were these ghosts? What actually did people see? And what's interesting about this is what they would see is things like flickering lights, cold spots, hearing, eerie noises. Like I thought it was just a generic thing. That's why I didn't even write it down. But on this website, I found IllinoisHauntedHouses.com. I'm looking at this and... I guess there's some controversy about the Bayless story. One person says that, yes, a woman did throw her baby down a trash chute at Western Illinois University, but it was at Corbin Hall, and the baby survived. The baby survived the fall, and then she didn't hang herself. So different hall, same baby. <laughs> I mean, that, those details are pretty specific. Apparently it happened at Corbin Hall that at some point, and I tried looking this up, I couldn't find you know, like a true crime article about this or anything. I mean, unfortunately, I do see articles about other babies being thrown down trash chutes in different parts of the country, but Corbin Hall was where the baby was thrown down the trash chute, and the not only did the mother not hang herself, the baby survived the fall. And was adopted by a local family. And then some of this has to be. This next one has to be fake. This one has to be fake. It says. Someone left a comment on this Illinois Haunted House website. It says. This is a different comment than the one I was just looking at. It says. In the case of the girl having a baby. She did not hang herself. So it's also verifying the fact that. This girl didn't kill herself in the closet. In the case of the girl having a baby. She did not hang herself. She became a mother and a teacher, WTF, and did no jail time. How do I know? I was the father of the baby. So this guy is either the oldest person using the internet. I don't know why I think the story would be so old. I mean, the college was established in 1899. I imagine this story took place in the 50s. I guess it could have took taking place in the 90s really or the 2000s but um i wanted to highlight that that's super interesting because here is an i here here's an example of people just they are just kind of making that one up possibly maybe that is just an urban legend but it again seemed to be based on some sort of fact i also couldn't verify i couldn't verify unfortunately i looked at one or two articles of babies being thrown down trash chutes and i was like nah, that's enough for today but According to these two anonymous people, one, the father of the child, the baby survived and was adopted out to another family, and the woman did not hang herself. That's an interesting little twist, but that's all not why we're here to begin with. We're not here. We've talked about Thompson Hall. We've talked about all Bayless Hall and Tanner Hall and all that. This is an interesting ghost story, and it's something that we talk about a lot on this podcast, and I think it's a really cool dynamic example of this type of haunting. We're in Washington Hall. Specifically, we're in room 1217. The story goes like this. There was a girl, we'll call her June. June lived in room 1217 while she was attending Western Illinois University. And she just got in a huge fight with her boyfriend. It's so loud, full of shouts and tears. Everyone can hear June and her boyfriend fighting, and eventually he storms out of her dorm room. June, who's just in pieces at this point, we don't know what the fight was over, but whatever it was, it was so painful, it was so draining, that June realized she couldn't go on any longer. 
whether it was a breakup fight or someone got caught cheating, whether they always fought or this was their first fight, whatever prompted this argument, this would be their last fight. Because June ended up taking her own life in room 1217. And her body wasn't found for two days until someone finally came to check on her and saw what had happened. So the story goes like this. In room 1217, and apparently this is happening even today, we don't know when this story took place, but in room 1217, the phone will ring. Bring. Bring, bring, bring. Nowadays, most people, you know, their cell phone is their main phone, but they still have a home phone. That's the phone that's ringing. It's the phone that's hooked up in room 1217. Bring, bring. And if you go and you pick up the phone... Hello? And the line is dead. You hang up the phone, you go about your day. But apparently this happens, it doesn't happen every single day, but it happens often enough that people have connected the phone ringing and no one being on the other line, connected to the death of June. But what's even more interesting about this story, right? So when you're reading it or when you're hearing it, you're thinking, okay, this maybe June is trying to connect with the real world. Maybe this is her spirit trying to make contact with the land of the living. No. The general consensus is, and this is this is absolutely heartbreaking. I when I read this, I go, man, this is terrible. I think we've all kind of been in this situation. The idea is the person on the other end of that phone who never says anything is June's boyfriend. And here's what's so tragic about that. I think we've all had pretty big blow-ups in our life, big fights with significant others, right? You storm out of there. You don't want to ever see them again. And you get home, and you start to calm down. And then you start to get worried. You said some things that you didn't mean. You said some things that you meant, but you shouldn't have said. They were poking at you, so you were poking at them even harder verbally. Of course, I'm not talking physical, but this argument is carrying on. and It's getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And you storm out and you leave her in tears and you go home and you realize, uh-oh. It might have been too much for her. And when you're ready to, right, you're probably still a little heated at this point because the argument was very personal. But when you're like, okay, listen, I'm calm now and I'm actually worried about her at this point. I don't want to go back over there because that could be a whole different issue. But I'll just call her. I just want to make sure she's okay. So you pick up the phone. Bring. Ring, ring. You're sitting there in your house and you're holding the phone to the ear and no one's picking up. Put the phone down. You go, okay, she probably knows it's me. Definitely knows it's me if she has caller ID. She's probably just really worked up right now. I did say a lot of stuff I shouldn't have said. I'll wait a bit. I'll wait for her to calm down too. Maybe she'll call me back. But a couple hours pass. Okay. I'm going to try calling her again because I feel really bad about what I said. I need to apologize to her. And I'm worried because I know how she can get. I know things she's said in the past. I just know she might make a massive mistake. Bring. Bring. Ring. No one's picking up the other line. 
I'll just let her sleep it off. I'll call tomorrow. Not just to apologize, but I'm worried about her. I'm afraid that she did something dumb. And the boyfriend, I imagine, called off and on for those two days. Calling the phone of a dead woman. And each time that phone didn't get picked up. Each time he called her and it just rang and rang and rang and rang and rang. His fears swelled. And we've all done this, right? We've all been in this situation where we do get in a huge fight. And after we leave, after everything's starting to calm down, you do start to think, oh my God, I said some horrible things to that person. And they may do something really, really dumb. And you start to play this mental game where, one, you're imagining the worst. And you do want to call her up. You do want to talk to her. But you also don't want to overreact. Your brain's going, no, no, she's not going to do that, dude. Just calm down. And you're constantly playing this thing where you don't want to overreact. You don't want to spark another fight. You may not necessarily want to apologize, right? You may feel like your side was warranted. You may feel like this, or at least part of the fight was just, just the heightened, it was just the heightened emotions that made it so dramatic. So you're not ready to apologize. You may not even need to apologize. She may be the person who did the wrong thing, but you're fighting this constant battle. You're terrified. You're worried. But at the same time, you're afraid that you may be overreacting. You're not actually going to drive back out there. can make things worse. You're trying to distract yourself. We're trying to do all these things, right? Now, every time that's happened to me... Now, every time that's happened to me, it's no one's ever killed themselves because I got in a huge fight with them or anything like that. But there is that, where, there is that moment where you're worried. Where you are back at your house and you realize... Probably shouldn't have said that. Probably shouldn't have said that. And she... It, it, does have some issues, depression issues, and she's talked about stuff in the past before, and now I might have just pushed her over the edge because I was a jerk. A just jerk, right? She did something, and, you know, the the fight was legit. It just got elevated too much. I've never had to deal with the outcome where someone's killed themselves because of that, but I've definitely been in that 48-hour cycle where I'm like, uh, she she may do something. But I don't want to overreact. I'm not going back there. I'll just try calling her. She's not picking up. Okay. Now I'm getting a little worried, but I still can't go over there. And then eventually she picks up and calls me an a-hole. And we argue it over the phone. And then, you know, we're back to normal. But in June's case, by the time her boyfriend left, got home, calmed down, and picked up the phone, she was already dead. He was calling the phone of a dead woman. Not just any dead woman. His girlfriend. The phone rang and rang. But it was too late. June was already dead. Now this is what I'm talking about. We talk about it on yesterday's episode. I've talked about it on a ton of episodes. Kind of in passing. This is what we would call a psychic hunting. It's not actually the boyfriend who's still alive who's calling the room. It's not the boyfriend's spirit who's calling the room. What we're experiencing is the pure traumatic event of someone trying to get hold of the woman he loves in the darkest moment of her life, the end of her life, and his worry and frustration and fear and anger and all of that is coming through those phone lines. That's why when you pick up the phone, you don't hear anything. This is a haunting that you cannot interact with. But it's so powerful. This has continued for years. Now, this could be an urban legend. We might be overanalyzing a tale that seniors tell freshman girls to scare them. And they call up the room and then hang up and it totally freaks the girls out. That's definitely possible. But the idea of psychic hauntings, that is something that is well known in the lore. And usually it's just someone walking down a hallway. Usually it's just seeing a face staring out of a window. 
I wanted to highlight this one because if it's true, it's a very dynamic version of that. It's interacting with the real world. It's something that's not just fooling your eyes. A mechanical device is activating. The phone is ringing. Electrical signals are coming through the line into that phone. That phone that probably rang off and on for two days. Until June's body was discovered. That boyfriend calling off and on for 48 hours. Each time she didn't pick up the phone, there was less anger and more fear in his voice. He's no longer mad at her. He doesn't care if she picks up the phone and starts screaming in his ear. He just wants to make sure she's okay. He just wants to make sure she's alive. He's going to keep calling until he hears June pick up the phone and tell him everything's okay. Then he can be relieved. Then he can relax. But June never picked up the phone. DeadRabbitRadio at gmail.com is going to be our email address. You can also hit us up at facebook.com slash deadrabbitradio. TikTok is at deadrabbitradio. Dead Rabbit Radio is the daily paranormal conspiracy and true crime podcast. You don't have to listen to it every day, but I'm glad you listened to it today. Have a great one, guys.